Hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Ling, and this is The Road to a Vaccine, a weekly live educational series exploring the COVID-19 crisis and the global community's efforts to develop a vaccine against the disease. We start with a vaccine update. Yesterday, many global leaders and organizations announced a pledge of financing to research, manufacture, and distribute a possible vaccine and treatments for COVID-19. Though they are going to continue raising funds, they have already secured over eight billion dollars for the effort. Now, one of the most polarizing issues in the news recently has been around some countries and U.S. states relaxing stay-at-home restrictions. Many feel it's too soon to open and are worried about a sharp rise in increases uh, in infections and deaths as a result. There's still so much we don't know about this virus. Meanwhile, it's taking a major toll on our frontline healthcare workers. In honor of National Nurses Day in the U.S. tomorrow, our focus today is more on the human side of COVID. While vaccines are being developed, we're looking at what's happening with the people facing the pandemic each day from the front lines. Our first guest is someone I am just in awe of. She will join us from the front lines in New Orleans to share uh, how she survived Ebola and finds the courage to keep fighting COVID. Then we'll have Dr. Larry Brilliant, one of the world's leading epidemiologists who was part of the team that helped to successfully wipe out smallpox, uh, which remains one of the, or the only human disease ever to be successfully eradicated. He'll talk about his experience and how we can emerge from the crisis. And then I am so moved by this story. Two physicians living perfectly comfortable lives, uh, working in a science lab, they took leave to go work in one of the busiest COVID-19 hospitals in the country. Now, if you have questions, please share them in the comment section and I will be asking them throughout the show. My first guest, as I mentioned earlier, has such an incredible story. Dr. Adora Akoli is an internal medicine resident physician in New Orleans. She's originally from Nigeria and contracted Ebola while treating patients in a Lagos hospital. Her story of survival and her dedication to preventing future epidemics is truly inspiring. Dr. Okoli, thank you so much for being with us. Now, COVID-19, as we said, is not the first pandemic you have experienced. You worked to fight Ebola and actually contracted the disease. Now, you've talked about feeling reborn after the experience. What did you learn from that experience and how has it impacted your work during this current pandemic? Thank you so much, Lisa, uh, for having me here today to be able to speak about my experience. Um, in 2014, I would say my life changed. Um, I was a normal you know, medical officer in a private hospital in Lagos, Nigeria when the Ebola outbreak you know, happened in West Africa and then came from Liberia to Nigeria. At the time, we were very unprepared for the, the outbreak. Um, but I eventually uh, contracted the disease while treating a Liberian patient who was in our private hospital in Lagos. Um, after about two weeks in isolation, I, I was discharged. Um, I, I survived the virus, the infection, but it was a narrow escape. Um, I can't tell you what happened, if it was my immune system that was strong enough, but I wasn't given any medications, you know, no ZMAP was accessible, no no uh, convalescent plasma that we could work with. Um, but I would say that certainly there's a purpose, there's a reason why that I survived, and um, it was like a rebirth for me, uh, adversity birth, you know, uh, my purpose to be here today and to be able to continue to do what I'm doing. But it taught me a couple of things. Um, I thought I was compassionate before I had Ebola. Um, I thought that, you know, I, I wanted to, to treat people, to take care of people. But then I realized that I didn't really have empathy. And um, that outbreak um, and experiencing the disease and what it did to people made me so empathetic. And uh, when I look at my patients here in New Orleans who have COVID-19, and um, they're asking the same questions that I asked when I was in isolation. Who is this doctor treating me? And I can only see their eyes. I don't really know who they are or what they look like. Um, they have all these questions. How long am I going to be here for? Am I going to survive this disease? Is it going to be two weeks? Um, are there any medications that I can take for this? What's next? I had all these questions when I was in isolation, and they have these questions as well. But you see, the thing is that it's a novel disease, just like the, the Ebola virus was novel to the West African region, even though it had been in existence since 19. Uh, 76, but we didn't know much about the disease. We don't have enough answers for our patients, but we can only do our best and give them what has been, you know, shown since this outbreak started. 
um, it taught me that infectious diseases is a disease of poverty. And truthfully, uh, when there's an outbreak of infectious diseases, it's usually the marginalized, disenfranchised, the, uh, you know, the um, African-American population, for instance, uh, is more affected in New Orleans than other populations, even though the African population here makes up 30% of the population, but COVID is affecting more than 60% of, of uh, uh, or rather more than 60% of COVID cases are African-American. So um, infectious diseases are here to stay if we do not address the underlying issues such as uh, health disparities that affect so many people. Dr. Okoli, in terms of the two pandemics, Ebola and, and COVID-19, are there similarities between uh, or in the way that the world has been reacting to them? I would say that similarities between Ebola and COVID a pretty a lot um, in terms of uh, the world continues to be um, reactive instead of being preemptive. So we we have a uh, uh, the habit of treating um, pandemics and outbreaks, you know, in such an emergent way. We you know raise money, we try and, and, and pump in billions into the outbreak. But as soon as the outbreak is over, when we're in our peace, uh, when we're in our peace moments, we don't actually do the work of building and strengthening our healthcare systems. And it's a global thing. You know, I would give an example with the Ebola outbreak uh, in 2014, 2016. When it happened in West Africa, um, you know, billions were pumped into the outbreak. And um, when the outbreak was over, we didn't do the work of strengthening the health systems. Uh, we still have a, a gross shortage of doctors. We still have a lack of water, you know, running water, soap to wash our hands. I mean, we don't even have oxygen concentrators in a lot of, you know, tertiary institutions. And we're talking about ventilators. You know, the ventilators are, you know, really the least of our issues right now. Um, we don't even have, you know, a, a, enough primary health care centers that can take care of the rural population and even the urban population. So it's about strengthening the health system and attending to these disparities. And it's the same thing that we're seeing here in the US. You know, we're reactionary, we're not preemptive. It's, it is times of peace that we should actually, you know, look to strengthening our system, building the infrastructure that we need to be able to combat outbreaks. We should expect outbreaks. We shouldn't be surprised that outbreaks are happening, given that we are doing a lot, you know, by entering into the habitats of the mammals and we're, you know, doing aggressive deforestation. We're doing aggressive mining and agriculture. So we should expect expect that as, as an interface between the mammalian population and the human population, that certainly all the millions of viruses that are also found in um, animals would jump into the human population. So we should actually be preemptive. And it's unfortunate that Ebola had been in existence since 1976. And it's now that we're, you know, talking about vaccines. It's been affecting populations for so many years. It wasn't the first outbreak ever of Ebola. It was actually a lot more. I mean, I think we've probably had a, almost 10 outbreaks in total, but it's, it was when it affected the world, the way it affected the world that we started to wake up to the realization that we needed to, you know, actually work towards getting a vaccine for Ebola. And the monies that we spent on the Ebola outbreak was more than what it would actually need to to build the systems. So it's something that I think that we should continue, we should start to look at as the world. We keep being reactionary instead of being preemptive. Yeah, I mean, it, it's still astounding to me how grossly unprepared the world has been uh, to this pandemic. You are in New Orleans right now, uh, a city that has just been battered over the years by a, a myriad of different things. Tell us about what is going on there now. New Orleans um, was hit by Ebola, was hit by COVID-19 in a way that other cities in the South was not hit, and we could say maybe it's because we, you know, have a lot of festivals here, and so it, when it comes to tourism, New Orleans is really a place where we have a lot of tourists. We had Mardi Gras, and we had Mardi Gras in February when, um, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, things were already happening in the COVID um, part of, you know, of things, and we didn't shut down the city as we should have on time. So um, from my experience with treating patients here, I'm finding that we have uh, um, more than half of the COVID cases are within the African-American population. And that speaks again to the health disparities that we have here. Um, we have a population of about 30% being African-American, but we have 
more than 50% being affected. And it's because, you know, African Americans do not have, you know, you know, the, the kind of access to health that is needed to be able to give them, you know, a fighting chance. A lot of African Americans have to, you know, work more than one job and uh, getting paid sick leave is an issue. So a lot of people will still go to work even when they don't feel well. Um, we have a, a, a very theming jail population with of course, more African American there. Uh, so we have to depopulate our prisons. We have all these issues, and it's, it's, it points to the fact that um, we need to give health for all and quality health for all. We have to deal with this health um, equity issues that we have, and that's you know um, uh, an underlying issue that we really haven't resolved. You're absolutely right on that, Dr. Okoli. I, I have a question from uh, someone who's watching named Tatiana from LinkedIn, and she asks, why the COVID spreads, spread is much worse than Ebola. Do you have any thoughts on that? The COVID spread is, is worse than Ebola because it's more contagious than Ebola. Ebola it was something that um, could happen and burn off quite quickly before it would actually spread out to the extent of, you know, um, 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 being more widespread than it is right now. Um, E Ebola had so many uh, uh, different symptoms and signs that came, but then it also would hit people within one week of getting the infection. But COVID-19, you're finding that people actually get sick around, really, really sick around the seven to 10 days of having the infection. So th there's more time for people to actually walk around with a dry cough and fever, you know, with the body aches and pains and more time to actually mix with the population and spread the disease, especially when they are pre-symptomatic as we are finding, which wasn't the case with Ebola. I mean, with Ebola, you would, you know, um, still uh, have the fever and maybe within the first two days of having fever, you might not be able to spread the infection. But with, with COVID-19, before you even have symptoms of COVID-19, you are already uh, spreading the infection, which is, which is what makes it uh, more uh, 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 contagious than Ebola. Dr. Okole, you you've seen a lot of loss, but you are also the embodiment of hope. What gives you hope that we can get through this? I think that um, it's in times of, of hardship and in times of suffering that we really see the resilience in of the human spirit. Um, it's in times of, you know, a uh, uh, crisis like this that you see the human of spirit and people come together to work as one. And when you hear stories about different countries and different places that have experienced the COVID-19 outbreak and have been really devastated like Italy, now seeing a gradual reduction in the number of new cases and you see that they're gradually reopening the economy and it tells you that there's hope for tomorrow. When I see a patient who was intubated now being extubated and no longer needing the ventilator, I know that there's hope. When I see a patient who was having uh, uh, you know, a, a need regularly a need for dialysis, no longer needing dialysis, I know that there's hope. Um, when I also look at the fact that what is life without hope? It's futile. It's, it's, it makes no sense. That is the essence of living is that we have the hope that there is a tomorrow, that, that there's a hope that each of us has a destiny and a purpose to fulfill. And that's what makes us, you know, go at it every day, wake up in the morning with a strength and a vitality that we can definitely beat this and we will beat this. Dr. Okoli, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Your parent, your patients are so lucky to have you for your expertise, but but especially for your compassion and your heart. Thank you again and be safe out there, okay? Thank you so much, Lisa. Now, in case you're just joining us, I'm Lisa Ling and this is The Road to a Vaccine, a weekly exploration of the COVID-19 crisis and the global community's efforts to develop a vaccine against the disease. I wanna remind everyone to ask questions in the comment section and I will do my best to get to them throughout the show. Now, when we think of the front lines, we don't often think of epidemiologists. These are the men and women who investigate patterns and causes of diseases and work to prevent future outbreaks. Earlier today, I spoke with Dr. Larry Brilliant, one of the world's leading epidemiologists. He has fought flu, polio, and blindness and was part of the team that helped to eradicate smallpox. He also was an advisor to the movie Contagion, which I'm sure many of us have rewatched lately.
Dr. Larry, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. So this episode, we're talking to people on the front lines, and you certainly have been on the front lines of epidemiology and have been for many years. In fact, you've been predicting a global pandemic for a very long time. Did you feel like you were crying wolf? Uh, and what about COVID uh, did you expect, and has it surprised you? Well, first, it's very nice to talk to you. Uh, I think that we use this term Cassandra very, you know, glibly, but every epidemiologist has been a bit of a Cassandra because we've all seen this coming. Uh, with 30 to 50 novel viruses, jumping species to human beings, causing small outbreaks in the last 20 years or so, it was inevitable that one of them would ignite a forest fire of an epidemic. Um, it feels um, poignant, um, an opportunity missed. Uh, the British would say an own goal, self-inflicted wounds. We could have done so much better if we had prepared for this everywhere in the world better. Did anyone heed the warning sufficiently or correctly? Well, I think Thailand has. Uh, they've created an app called Dr. Me, which allows people to report dead chickens or birds or cows or sick animals, as well as sick humans. Um, they've done really well with the importation of MERS. There was a, another disease, another coronavirus. There have been two others, SARS and MERS. Uh, and uh, Thailand did very well. Uh, one was imported into South Korea, the other into Thailand. Uh, and South Korea had hundreds of deaths. Uh, Thailand had only one. And I think that's probably the reason that South Korea has done so extremely good uh, a job this year, this time, because having had the experience of MERS and the hundreds of people that were hurt by it, uh, the government was sensitive to, responded. I would say there was a three or four week delay when uh, the, the, the virus infected a church group. And then once they understood what had happened, the South Koreans were terrific. Uh, you can just look at the way South Koreans feel about their government now. They're so proud of their government's ability to make them safe. There are other places that have done a really good job. They tend to be islands. Uh, Taiwan has done a great job. New Zealand has done a great job. Iceland, three island republics. That kind of tells us a little bit about it's easier to protect an island um, than it is a, a big landmass in a big country. But certainly, if you name all the major countries of the world, not one of them would say they were completely proud of how they've done and that they couldn't do something better. Well, they certainly, uh, the countries that you mentioned took action right away, which many countries didn't. Um, given that you've been predicting a global pandemic for so long, has COVID been more ferocious than you anticipated? Yes different. Uh, it, it is a disease that is respiratory in one sense only, that it's spread mostly by the respiratory route. But when we say respiratory disease in medicine, our minds automatically go to URIs, upper respiratory illnesses, or to flu. This is nothing like a flu. Um, this affects every cell in the body from nose to toes, literally. It affects your sense of smell. You get COVID toes that look like frostbite occasionally, kidney disease, your liver is impaired, heart disease that often causes heart failure. The lung devastation is well documented, the loss of taste and smell, conjunctivitis, stroke. There's something about this disease that is not only different, it is pernicious in the way that it affects some people and causes such a difficult and painful death. Well, there has been a, a positive advancement this week. A new antiviral treatment has just received FDA approval to treat COVID-19. How significant a development is this? And does it make you feel like we can start to feel more comfortable getting back to normal because of this? Yeah, there's an old uh, Native American expression that you have two wolves in your head. Um, you know, one is telling you to uh, be greedy and the other is telling you to be kind. Uh, and the old man asks 
is asked by the young men, which wolf will win? And they say, whichever wolf you feed. Uh, I can give you a wonderful uh, message. I mean, it is the first proof of concept that we have something that will stop this virus. But it's also a very weak proof. The, the study of its effect on deaths was um, too weak a study uh, to show any discernible difference in a statistically significant way. And it only improved days in the hospital by four days. That after changing the goalposts of changing what it is they were trying to prove. So I can be aspirationally hopeful that it will play a major difference. I'm certainly practically thrilled that we have anything, but we've got a long way to go. This antiviral as it is, is certainly not the answer. It's not the magic bullet. It's not going to make our world that much safer. We have a lot more work to do, but I'm thrilled that we've taken this baby step. Dr. Brilliant, the, the impact of this uh, pandemic extends beyond those just with the disease. Um, there are people who aren't able to get things like cancer treatment. Um, they're not able to get um, access to the health care that they need. So what has been the ripple effect on other aspects of the healthcare system and what can we do about it? Can we can we start to normalize anything related to health care right now outside of COVID? Well, this is the reason for social distancing. If you don't have social distancing, you have such a rush of disease all at once, everywhere at the same time, that all the healthcare facilities are flooded with COVID patients and there's no room anymore for the, the difficult pregnancy, for somebody getting chemotherapy or somebody having a heart attack. By spacing the disease out, and not, not to think of them as mountain peaks, but to think of them as waves and wavelets coming onto the shore. By spacing those waves out, which is what we've done with social distancing successfully, that allows a space in which the demands on the healthcare system are not this overwhelming surge of cases of, of the pandemic. So we are able to treat more people than we would have been otherwise, but certainly not enough. There's a, uh, the United States and most of the world has a supply chain, has a healthcare system without much surge capacity. And that's what leads to many of the deaths. Look at Germany, which does have a lot of surge capacity and their death rate is so much lower. Their case, case rate may not be, but the consequences of getting sick in Germany are far less severe than they are in much of the rest of the world because they have a universal healthcare system, because they've overbuilt, they have surge capacity. I hope that's a lesson for us for the future. Dr. Brilliant, smallpox was one of the biggest pandemics of the 20th century. And as recently as 1967, the WHO estimated that it was still killing 2 million people a year. It took almost 30 years to fully eradicate the disease, and you were a very big part of the, the effort that made that happen. Um, what gives you hope that we can eradicate COVID? Well, smallpox actually killed half a billion people in the 20th century, 500 million. It may have been the most lethal disease in human history, um, but we worked really hard and we had a strategy, which was search and containment, surveillance, and containment, just like the contact tracing uh, things that you're looking at. It was the same kind of a thing, but we had a vaccine. Um, we could do many of those same things today uh, if we replace the vaccine with quarantine. And I'm optimistic that we are increasingly able to do that. When I visited the last case of smallpox, the killer smallpox, variola major, that occurred in nature, a little girl named Rahima Banu on the uh, the Bola Island in Bangladesh, a little village called Karalia. And when she recovered and the scabs of smallpox fell on the ground and they were kind of cooked in the hot Bengal sun, that was the end of an unbroken chain of transmission that went all the way back to Pharaoh Ramses, unbroken for thousands of years, and it ended. And with it, all of the death and destruction from that disease ended. When you've seen that, which was only done because of the World Health Organization, WHO, because if you see something like that for the rest of your life, you can never be a pessimist. And so I'm optimistic that we will throw this disease too 
into the dustbin of history. Dr. Brilliant, thank you for um, those hopeful sentiments. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for having me. And that was Dr. Larry Brilliant, one of the world's leading epidemiologists. For those of you just joining, I'm Lisa Ling, and we're back with you live. Please, if you have questions, ask them in the comment section, and we will try to get to as many as we can throughout the show. Coming up, we'll be talking to two doctors courageously caring for parents, at, patients at the Coney Island Hospital, uh, which is one of the, the hardest hit in the country. But first, our next segment is Vaccines 101. This is where we look more closely at the science and process of how vaccines are created. And today, all the way from Belgium, we have Dr. Johan van Hoof, Global Head of Infectious Diseases and Vaccines for Janssen, to shed some light on how vaccines go from being designed and into manufacturing. Hello, Dr. Van Hoof. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi, Lisa. Glad to be here. So I heard, Dr. Van Hoof, that you and your team were just coming up from air, for air after working five hard years getting the Ebola vaccine to people in East Africa. You were just about to exhale when Dr. Paul Stoffel said, get ready for COVID. What has it been like for you to switch gears so quickly? And, and what is the environment like there in your labs for, for you and your team as you work on the COVID vaccine? Yeah, indeed. We, as you said, we were just finishing uh, the, the job for Ebola, so to say, and uh, the teams had been working very hard over the past years to uh, to prepare the, the the documentation and have it all uh, submitted to the agencies. And we hope in the weeks to come to have a positive feedback from that one. And also, uh, we have been working very hard to have the vaccine that is currently used in in Rwanda uh, and also in in DRC. Uh, to help in, in controlling the, the outbreak, which in DRC is still ongoing. Uh, back in January, in the early days, uh, I actually had already discussed with uh, Dr. Paul Stoffels that uh, we had heard about that uh, outbreak in uh, in China, and we assumed that one day this could become a threat to the world. And just out of uh, curiosity, we actually had uh, decided to take a look at the genetic code and uh, make an assessment on whether yes or no, leveraging our platforms and our technology, we could uh, be part of the solution here. Uh, and actually, coincidentally, that same weekend, I indeed got a phone call from uh, Dr. Stoffels asking me, uh, hey, Johan, do you think we can uh, make contribution here? And that's indeed where uh, the excitement started again. And uh, it's a strange feeling because it's mixed feelings. Of course, we are. Uh, concerned about the COVID situation in the world. Uh, in the beginning of, of, of the days, back in January, we didn't realize yet how fast it would come to, to the rest of the world. That things evolve, we certainly get more and more nervous about that one. At the same time, also excited because we, uh, we see this as part of our mission to make sure that we leverage uh, the technology that we have uh, to make it available to address uh, threats like the ones that we talk about. It's based on that uh, a vision that we also started with Ebola back in 2014, and that we now have entered into the field with uh, with COVID. And I must say that uh, since January of this year, uh, our teams have been working around the clock, uh, doing uh, many things in, in parallel, uh, things that normally should be do, done sequentially, really aiming to develop it as soon as we can, such that we can start these clinical trials in humans uh, later this year, and, uh, and really, I'm enthused by what I see happening there. It's also heartwarming to see how many people from within the organization actually get a lot of energy of the notion that we can help to bring the solution to people. And, and I see many people volunteering and contacting us within JNJ to see how can we help uh, and, and what type of support would you still need? And it's really heartwarming to see this. That is quite moving. And, and Dr. Van Hoof, I want to get more into vaccine development in a moment, but I have to, to ask you about something that so many of our viewers and so many people around the world are wondering, which is about immunity and antibody testing. Um, in, in your perspective, if you have antibodies, does it mean that you are immune from COVID? Uh, well, first of all, we don't know that much about the virus and still uh, a lot has to be learned. We can only look at what we know about other coronaviruses, 
And from those, it is known that for some of these coronaviruses, they actually, uh, after having gone through it, you are protected for some time, but not eternally. And after a few years, uh, it looks like you can be reinfected by that uh, virus. We don't know if it's a similar pattern for the COVID uh, virus, but I think it's reasonable to assume not to be over optimistic for the moment. And it, I think the, the, the future will tell us, but it's reasonable to assume that if you have had a recent history of, uh, the, uh, of the infection, that at least for the coming months, you most likely are protected, but nobody knows it with certainty. And it's also linked to the fact that not, not all antibodies that we produce as a reaction to a virus are really what we call functional. So you have antibodies that really don't help in, in protecting against the virus. You have antibodies that might help in protecting against the virus, and we call those neutralizing antibodies. And that's what we all hope to induce with the, the vaccines that we are testing and going to test. Well, in terms of the vaccine, is it possible to, de to determine how long the immunity provided by the vaccine will be? And will we need to get, for example, a booster shot uh, the following year for it? It's a, it's a very good question. It's actually a question that is there for any new vaccine that you develop. So going back in history, even for hepatitis B, uh, that exists since since the 80s, uh, you don't know up front how long protection will be. You can uh, have an idea about the level of antibodies you need to have to be protected, but you don't know how low they can go before you get reinfected again. And also the good thing is about our immune system is that very often you induce immune memory. That means that when, our, when you have been vaccinated, let's say for hepatitis B, even if your antibodies are extremely low, when you're in contact with the virus, your immune memory, your memory in your body that immediately recognizes the virus and, and gives that, that response and that protection. Where the similar mechanism will be there for COVID, we don't know. But so historically, it is usually recommended to monitor this closely. And it, it's not excluded that the booster dose, dose might be needed, but only future will tell us. Well, as you know, the world is anxiously awaiting a vaccine and, and hungry for information about it. But I, what I want to know is what are the, the ideal characteristics of a vaccine and, and what needs to happen before it goes into testing? That's a very good question indeed. When you look to the, the COVID uh, vaccine that we all try to, to come up with now is that we are actually, at least from a Janssen perspective, we are building on two pillars. On one hand, what has been learned from the experience with the first SARS, small SARS epidemic back in the early 2000s. And at that time, uh, it was uh, shown that you could actually develop vaccines that were able to protect animals from infection. So you vaccinated animals and you cannot infect them with the virus. Those vaccines actually worked to making sure that you have antibodies that target the specific part of the virus, the so-called spike protein. And the good news is that SARS-2 is very similar to SARS-1. So the COVID virus is very similar to the very first SARS virus. We know we use the same way to enter into the cells of the human lung. And therefore, uh, we assume that what was possible for SARS-1 will also possible for this one. So everyone is hoping that with the vaccine platforms that we have, we can induce these antibodies that target that protein such as that the virus cannot enter the cells. That's the first very important piece of knowledge we have. The second one, which is certainly important if you want to go fast, be able to produce fast and, and also roll it out in many, many people, is to use technologies that are already are established to some extent. So the technology that we are using within Janssen is technology which has been used in our research programs already across many programs. And based on that, we know quite well that platform, that technology, and also the regulators who have seen those data have a certain level of comfort. What we see is we have already vaccinated through our R&D program more than 60,000 people. So from that perspective, we have, and those people included children, included people infected with HIV, it included elderly, also pregnant women. So we know that the vaccine from that perspective uh, is well tolerated. Tolerability is not different from other routine vaccines. And also we, in those, that population of over 60,000, we have not seen any safety signal of concern. 
So from that perspective, we know the platform, the technology seems safe to use, which gives a, gives a level of confidence. The other one is that across our programs, we have seen that we have the right type of immune responses. So combining these, it means that we can really go fast into early development, check if you have the right immune responses, and then roll it out in a larger population. Dr. Van Hoof, we have a viewer from JNJ.com who's asking, how do you plan to scale the number of vaccine units needed globally to achieve herd immunity? That's a very good question, and it's actually a global effort, and we have to realize that the demand for vaccine will be enormous. So we sincerely hope that more than one vaccine developer will be successful. From our perspective, we uh, have already a manufacturing plant that is upscaled in the Netherlands, which has two large bioreactors, and, and thanks to the technology we use, the yields that come out of those bioreactors are very high, so we can actually produce uh, on an annual base more than 300 million doses uh, theoretically out of that, uh, of that plant. We actually have announced last week that we now uh, plan doing tech transfer, that means the manufacturing process, uh, transferring it to other manufacturing plants in the world. And the first that has already been announced last week, uh, which we will do in, in the US with uh, a, a local uh, contracting manufacturing organization there. And we have decided to invest already at risk in building up that production such that towards the end of the year, we can really ramp up that production. Dr. Van Hoof, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and, and also for your dedication, uh, especially after coming off five years of, of developing a, a vaccine for Ebola. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My next guests are two doctors who gave up their comfortable lives and decided to volunteer together at one of the US's, uh, one US hospital's most uh, or busiest uh, hospitals with COVID cases. They are Dr. Ed Kuffner and Dr. Caleb Hernandez. Welcome doctors. Now you two have been working together in labs and hospitals now, uh, but you both decided to take time away from your day jobs to volunteer at Coney Island Hospital. How did you find yourselves volunteering together and how has it been having a colleague to share these experiences with? Dr. Hernandez? Well, um, you know, it was something where I have uh, J Pals here at Johnson and Johnson. So I, our company is part of Johnson and Johnson J Labs, and we were assigned some mentors. And I was having a communication about beating COVID with some of these mentors, and I let them know that I was interested in helping. And well, one of the mentors said, "You know, Ed, your mentor is actually also helping out in Brooklyn." So I had already started the process of uh, of uh, volunteering and getting credentialed, and uh, I contacted Ed, and he said. I'd love to have you over here. What happened? I think Dr. Hernandez, we we're having some issues with your audio. Dr. Kuffner, are you still there? Are you hearing me? Okay. I am. I am. So I I feel like uh, Caleb and I were almost destined to work together in the emergency department. As he said, uh, we started working together in my role as the chief medical officer for consumer for J and J, and his role at J Labs with his company Certidose, uh, trying to decrease medication errors, an area of interest of both of us. And as we started working together, we're both emergency physicians. We realized that we yeah. had shared uh, some common friends and started to think about it. Well, I did my training in emergency medicine in New York City, as did Caleb. I went out to work in Colorado and worked in the emergency department, as did Caleb. Uh, I have a few more gray hairs than Caleb. I was there a, a little bit before him. And so uh, I really thought, all right, it would be great to work with him. He's such a fantastic, innovative guy. He's so compassionate. And uh, when it came about that we could work together, I remember saying to people, man, I bet he's an awesome ER doc. And man, he is unbelievable. So it's been so fun to work with him and have a partner who you knew prior to getting into the emergency department and we developed that trust. And so um, in a really crazy situation, that's been a ray of hope for both of us. Doctors, how have your families felt about this? I mean, there have been many doctors and healthcare workers the world over who have perished as a result of this virus. How do they feel about you putting your 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 day jobs on hold and and walking into the fire so to speak dr hernandez 
Well, um, my mom's really brave. And when she was younger, she was a risk taker as well. You know, she, if she believed in something, she would go do it. And she's been to a lot of dangerous places. So um, my mom's all for it. And I'll let Dr. Kuffner uh, go on, on what he says. Sure, I think for all the healthcare it? workers, I think for all the healthcare workers on the front lines, um, without the support of your family and friends, there's there's no way that you could do it. And so I know my wife, Heather, was a, a little bit nervous um, about it, but she knows me. She knows I'm an emergency physician. She knows I really felt it was my duty to go up and uh, help out in New York City. She knows, I obviously, we met in New York City, my wife and I. I went to medical school in uh, in Brooklyn, did my residency in New York, as I said. And for me personally, um, I felt like I had an obligation to give back to the people of New York City who helped me develop my medical skills, both in medical school and during residency. And so I'm very appreciative of her support and the support of my family, because that really allowed me to go and really focus on the patients. Let's talk about your experiences on the front line. Um, and also about the community in Brooklyn, because it has been very hard hit by COVID. How did the hospital work to handle the influx of cases? And, and, and can you describe the environment when it was at its most severe? Dr. Kupner? Sure. Um, I arrived a little bit before the, the lead up to the surge about 40% of the attendings in the emergency department, including some of the residents, were actually out sick with COVID. Um, they were starting to see a very large increase in volume and increases in acuity. And I give uh, my friend who was the chairman of the emergency department, Dr. Mark Kinshu, and the hospital administration at Coney Island a lot of credit because they had the foresight to think we're going to need to accommodate increased volumes. And so they actually put a tent up in the parking lot and when I first got there, the tent was just going up and um, they essentially tasked me with saying, all right, let's figure out how we're going to get this tent up and running. And so in the first couple of days, I was there on my hands and knees with masking tape on the floor, figuring out how are we going to develop this out into some different pods? How are we going to work the flow in the emergency department? Um, what type of equipment were we going to need? Um, and a lot of those things that you may say are these little details in the end they really made all the difference and so once we got the tent up and running we were able to take walk-in patients patients from ambulances who weren't as sick as the ones that needed to be in the main er and they tr transfer patients over to us from the main er we had volunteers from all over the u.s nurses and doctors and nurse practitioners and pas who came to help out and that whole group came together as a team and as we referred to the tent we referred to it as our house and I'm really proud of the care that that entire team delivered to those patients under extremely difficult circumstances. And there's so much ugliness about the disease, but those stories are exemplifications of, of really the best in humanity. Uh, Dr. Hernandez, I, I know a lot of people are wondering now, are things getting better? Or do you believe the worst is yet to come at, at, at your hospital? Have you seen things improving? Yeah, so I could definitely tell you that the social distancing and also the stay at home orders have worked. Uh, when we first started out, the volumes were just so large and so crazy. And in New York, that wasn't even, that was just a small piece of New York's population that had become infected. And it was creating such a big problem in our healthcare system. Uh, but within four weeks, uh, it was almost as if somebody had just flipped the switch. Next thing you know, the, these insane volumes, 400% of what you would expect an ER to handle went down to, you know, a more manageable amount. Now, it was still very busy, and these were still mostly COVID patients, but um, you can only imagine how bad it would be. Um, I, I think there's also just something that even though the volumes coming into the ER went down, because the disease lasts so long in the body, we still have uh, ICUs that are just packed and people that are fighting for their lives there. And I think that's that system's still at capacity. The CDC has just uh, issued a warning because many states are, are beginning to relax restrictions that there could be imminently up to 200,000 cases a day. Uh, what do you think about that? And will you still continue to go back to treat patients if those numbers start to escalate again? Dr. Kuffner? 
Sure. So I, I think um, we all need to really respect this virus. Um, I think we've been living with it for a number of months. We've seen the surge in New York City. None of us as healthcare workers ever want to experience what we experienced in New York City during that surge. Um, when I talk to people, I don't think they realize how unpredictable this virus is. And let me tell you a story. There was a, a police officer who came into the tent while we were there, and this guy was, you know, 6'3", strapping, fit guy. And he came in on a stretcher, and I said to him, well, do you think you can walk about, you know, 10, 10 feet, 10 yards um, over to a cot? And he said, sure, he can. And he starts to walk, and about halfway there, he's struggling. I'm thinking, I'm going to need to hold this, this guy up. Uh, on a normal day, this guy could pick me up over his head and twirl me around. He stayed with us in the, the tent for about three days. He's one of those patients you really connected with and you got to know. Um, he eventually got transferred back into the hospital to be admitted. And about a week later, I started thinking about about him and said, I really wonder what happened to him. And he was in his you know late, late 30s. And so I decided to call him up on his cell phone and look him up in the medical record system and gave him a call. And I'll tell you, as that cell phone was ringing, I, my palms were sweaty um, and I was actually worried because I didn't know whether this young, healthy guy actually was going to survive or not. And I'll tell you, I was so relieved when I heard his voice on that phone. And it, I don't mean to be dramatic. But at the end of the day, when you're working in the emergency department and you see people your age or younger, some of them who have no medical problems, who come in and some have died, and others will be left with debilitating um, complications of the heart attacks, the strokes, the blood clots that they get in their lungs. What I would say to people is, listen, we really as a society need to continue to hang together. We need to make sure that we maintain the social distancing. We need to make sure that we're maintaining those good personal hygiene measures because this virus is going to be with us for months and maybe years to come. And it's up to us. The onus on us is to protect others in society and protect those healthcare workers who are on the front lines every day. Dr. Kuffner and Dr. Hernandez, thank you so much for your extraordinary sacrifices and for taking the time to be with us today and to all healthcare workers the world over. Thank you. Next week, we'll be meeting some incredible nurses who are saving lives every day. Please keep submitting your questions at jnj.com slash road to a vaccine, and we'll be answering more on Tuesday of next week on another live episode. I'll leave you with this very special international tribute now. Thank you to our guests for being here and to everyone for watching. In Canada, I am a nurse that works in the ICU. I'm an nurse assistant in Newcastle. I am an infectious disease fellow. And I am an emergency room registered nurse in British Columbia, Canada. Currently working on one of the COVID wards. One of the most uplifting things during this challenging time is the patient spaces when we can connect with loved ones and relatives all around the world using video call. Hearing the sound of cool joy from our PA system, which signifies that a patient with COVID-19 has recovered and is already on their way home to their families. What? kind of gives me hope during this time, it's probably my sense of community in my city. I honestly cannot do my job if it weren't up for my family, friends, and my community. A discharge patient who's recently tested positive and who's recovered from the coronavirus, we all stand and clap for them because they've been through such a horrible time. They survived and the love and affection they get when they leave and they say the family is absolutely amazing. I just want to say a big thank you to all healthcare professionals around the globe working hard during this pandemic. We cannot thank everyone enough for their generous support and donations. It was really, really heartwarming to know that there are a lot of people who care about the people who are essential workers. Signs of appreciation like cookies, it's really, really nice to know that.